All right, Exodus chapter 2, when you find that, would you stand up and we'll, uh, or I'll, I'll read, you read along, Exodus chapter 2, we'll just read verse 11 through 15. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 2, starting verse 11. And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens. And he smited an Egyptian, smiting a Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he looked this way and that way. And when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And when he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together. And he said to him that did the wrong, Wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? And he said, Who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killed us the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. Now when Pharaoh heard these things, I was, I'll pick up there next week. Lord, we, I ask your blessings on the service. Uh, we thank you for your word and pray you bless in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. <clears throat> title of the message this morning is Somebody is Always Watching. Isn't that sound kind of creepy? But it's true. We understand this now in this generation more than ever, I think. <laughs> Somebody is always watching. It's being recorded. You know, whatever you do, there's a surveillance camera. There's something picking you up. There's somebody, uh, you know, who's, who's got that. We, I, I used to, uh, uh, there was a gentleman that came here a while back, had some, uh, had some mental issues that were little obstacles, made us kind of hard to, uh, uh, to, to work with them sometimes. Uh, but sometimes he would get manic. And, uh, and he would have, you know, he would do some weird things. And then all of a sudden, what we'd find out whenever he was having one of these manic episodes is he would start uploading all these conversations on YouTube. And there are conversations that nobody knew he was recording. <laughs> I found out at one point that every time we were in the car, like he just had this app on his phone that was just constantly recording everything. And, uh, and you know, it was just kind of creepy. And then you start thinking every time I have a conversation with him, like he's probably recording everything that, that we're saying, <laughs> you know, but it's a, that's not a fun thing to think about. But the reality is like nowadays, I mean, every, there's records of everything. And, uh, and I sometimes will watch these like true crime and, and people that solving cases and they're doing the interviews and all this stuff. And I'm telling you what, you go back to the seventies and eighties and it's like, well, they didn't have the technology back then. So it was hard to prove this and hard to prove that. Nowadays, the technology's there, okay? You're not getting away with anything. <laughs> but of course, in the message, I'm not talking about Big Brother or <laughs> somebody like that. I'm the, uh, well, you just have to wait until I preach the message. Okay, look at verse 11 and 12. Verse 11 and 12 said, And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out unto his brethren, and he looked on their burdens, and he spied an Egyptian, smiting an Hebrew, uh, one of his brethren. And he looked this way and that way, and when he saw that there was no man, but obviously there was, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Now, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, uh, it kind of gives us, it's one of those stories, I think I've shared a few of them in this series, one of the stories that that tells the life of, of, uh, of Moses. And in Hebrews 11, verse 24 and 25, it says, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Now, anytime we read a story in the Bible that's very heavily, uh, you know, like, like there's a lot of Hollywood renditions of it and movie stories, children's books and all that. It's very important that we read the scripture and try to ignore what we've heard said about the story and just get the facts of the story from, from what the Bible says. And, and thankfully, like I said, we have like three, three accounts of this story where, you know, somebody's preaching about the life of Moses and refers back to this, but gives us some details that maybe we didn't know uh, that somehow they know. And th we can take those stories and we can get, we can pull some truths out of that. Uh, but, you know, ultimately we can't go off of what we saw on the animated movie Prince of Egypt, <laughs> okay, is what I'm getting at. <laughs> and so uh, uh, I love the soundtrack, but, you know, anytime you watch a movie that is like got the Bible story that is 
you know, been made for Hollywood, you can just rest assured, okay, they're going to leave stuff out or they're going to twist some, uh, some meanings there or whatever. Okay, but it seems like to me, what the story that we're reading right here is Moses' first experience as like a Christian, like seeking the Christian life. You say, oh, Christian, Jesus wasn't even here yet, okay? Go real quickly w with me, if you would, to actually the passage that I was just reading. But go to Hebrews chapter 11. I want you to see this. Hebrews chapter 11. And I just read 24 and 25. Let me back up and read 24 again. It says, Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Now, Hebrews 11, cha uh, uh, chapter 11, verse 26. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. So the idea is, if we're talking about Old Testament characters and we call them Christians, it's okay. Really, because it's, it's really, in many ways, the same religion. Okay? Now, the Jews that rejected Christ, they're not following the religion that God intended for them to follow. Everybody understands that, right? I just gave an example when I was soul winning on that Thursday. And this guy said, well, we believe, this Jew, guy that was a self-professed Jewish said, we believe the Old Testament and you believe the Old Testament. I'm like, ah, we believe some different things about the Old Testament for sure. Okay? And I believe that was all pictured of Christ who was coming, and then Christ came and he fulfilled all these things, whereas this man didn't, didn't believe that. Okay, so it's okay whenever I make the application here, which I'm going to make throughout the message, that Moses like, began his life as a Christian. Okay, so that when I compare that to us, we can look back in the Old Testament and we can say the Christian life is kind of like the Hebrews doing this or doing that. It's okay. It, it, the picture's there, okay, for sure. So, so I just had to say that to back before somebody says he doesn't even know what he's talking about. They couldn't have been a Christian. He was way back in the Old Testament. No, the Bible says that he esteemed the suffering of Christ, right, better than uh, the pleasures. Or I can't remember how he says it. And, uh, and so Moses began his Christian life, so to speak, with this great tragedy where he commits murder. And then he's found out, okay? And so this whole story that I'm telling today is just like his first experience. Now, how do we know that it's, the, it's his first experience? Like, we don't know 100% sure, like we can't tell from the passage, you know, when he actually made the choice to, uh, hey, I'm going to leave Egypt here and I'm going to go be with my people. We don't know that. We know that the Bible says that in the passage I just read, choosing rather to suffer affliction with, with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season. But if you're back in Exodus chapter 2, look at verse 11. And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown. Okay, so that sounds a lot like what we read in Hebrews 11 where it says, and when he was come to years. Okay, so he's grown up now. This is the same passage that he's talking about in Hebrews 11. And then it says this in verse 13. And when he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews drove together. So why would it say second day? Why didn't he say the next day? The second day as opposed to like he went out the first day to look at his brethren and then the second day that he went. So it's talking, you know, it's just kind of followed up with what he did. So I don't know the whole story. I don't know. Again, I could look at Hollywood. I could read books that, you know, have been written on the subject and try to draw some things out of the story. But we really don't understand. You know, like Josephus might have a few things to say on it. I don't know. But, you know, he's, he's a, uh, the Jewish historian uh, from many years ago. But we don't really know. But it appears to me like, like Moses, who has now spent, you know, 40 years, like being raised in Egypt un, in, uh, under uh, uh, Pharaoh, you know, in Pharaoh's kingdom, basically, his daughter raising him. And now he has decided, I mean, now, he knew all along, and again, I'm making reference to that animated movie a while back. Like, in that movie, I remember watching that and saying, and they made it look like he had no idea. And then all of a sudden, one day, he bumps into his, his sister, and she says, hey, don't you know who you are, or whatever. I don't think that's how it happened. Based on what I'm reading, it looks like he always knew that those were his people. Like, I don't think he was left, you know, to not believe that. But then at some point when he come to years, when he was old, he said, you know what, I'm going to go to my people and bear the suffering with them and all that kind of stuff. But hey, that didn't 
last very long. Because <laughs> the story we're reading here, like the first day, he killed somebody. The second day, he's on the run. And so this is how he started his Christian life, so to speak, okay, for the sake of the analogy. Okay, uh, so it would seem that, you know, his, he had a rough start. And many years later, in fact, he's going to spend 40 years on the backside of the desert, the Bible says, and, uh, and he ends up Midian and, uh, you know, whole new life there for another 40 years until he returns and goes back to Egypt to set the people free. And, uh, and then we know the story. Later on, he's going to be given the law. And in the law, what is something that is reiterated, kind of like the number one law in regards to our, uh, you know, our behavior when, it, when dealing with other mankind, thou shalt not kill. And the Bible is very clear on the death penalty, you know, of those who would, would murder somebody. And make no mistake about it, Moses didn't accidentally kill an Egyptian. <laughs> I mean, you can't be any clearer than that. Like, again, some of the child-friendly stories, you know, make it seem like it was an accident. Oop, accidentally knocked somebody off of a bridge or something like that. And no, he looked this way, he looked that way, said, I don't see anybody looking, and then he killed the Egyptian, and then he hit him in the sand. I mean, that's, that's like life to, like, death penalty, <laughs> you know, type of, uh, <laughs> you know, if you did, if, if you premeditated something, and you look to make sure no one's there, and then you hid the body in the sand, whatever, you, yeah, you're going to jail, or you're going to get the death penalty, or, or whatever. So this was no accident. But I want to show here from this story, I want to talk about these things, very simple points, but basically the concept that somebody is always watching. Even when you don't think you're being watched, don't think that uh, anybody will know somebody is always watching. Number one, of course, God is watching. Okay, we, we have, uh, that's pretty simple. We understand that. If we're, we, we, we say that we believe that. I think everybody who claims to be a Christian is going to say, hey, there's nothing I can do that God doesn't see. You know, unless you really don't believe it and you're just like giving lip service, you know that God's watching everything you do. In Psalm 139, verse 8 says, If I ascend, this is David speaking, he said, If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Which is interesting because, you know, some people will say, Oh, no, God's not in hell. You know, he's, he has nothing to do with that. Look, God is everywhere present. Like, he, he's, he's there. You know, and in fact, the Bible talks about how the people in hell are being tormented and punished in his presence. All right? So he, he knows it's going on. Now, I'm not saying that he's doing the torturing. He has, you know, angels doing that, whatever. But it's doing in his presence. There's nowhere you can go that he's not there. It's not like, okay, well, he wouldn't come. He wouldn't go into this dark place. <laughs> you know, he wouldn't go into that bar with me or whatever. Look, he's there. He knows. He knows what you're doing. Uh, and I'm not talking about, you know, it sounds kind of like Santa Claus. He knows if you've been good or bad. No, this is the real deal. Okay, God, God knows. There's nowhere you can go. And so, so what will God do? So all of us have sinned, obviously. The Bible is clear. If any man says he has no sin, he's, he's deceived himself. And the truth's not in him. So like all of us have sinned. I would say all of us sin every day. I, I'm pretty confident in that. Okay. And so all of us have sinned, and, and, and the moment that we sin, you know, we have realized that, you know, God, God knows that we did that. And maybe we're not naturally going to be like, God, you know, I'm so sorry I did that, and like repent it, and just like asking forgiveness for that or whatever. But maybe something inside us is like, hey, I know what I did was wrong, but we'll just continue on and, uh, and act like nothing. And probably all of us have done that and gotten away with it. Right? I mean, come on, we've all sinned and then be like, hey, that wasn't so bad. I didn't, God didn't like strike me dead. And so that allows us sometimes to think like, eh, God, I, mean, I mean, maybe, I mean, I believe God's watching. I believe he sees everything I do, but he's pretty generous. He's pretty merciful. He's not going to, uh, you know, chastise me or whatever. No, you just wait. <laughs> okay, because he sees it and he will allow you. Here's what often happens. He'll allow somebody else to see or to catch you in the sin. You know, here's what it says in, in Numbers chapter 32, verse 23. It says, For if you will not do so, behold, ye have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. It's like just this reminder, like just, hey, 
Just, just know that eventually your sin will find you out. And so a lot of times, like, God's not surprised. God knows you're going to sin. He, you know, he's not surprised. But what God will a lot, a lot of times do is you'll seem like you got away with it for a while, and then all of a sudden that sin will be found out. Okay? And it's almost like we get so desensitized to the fact that God's watching and seeing everything that we do that we don't, you know, we don't respond to that in the same way that we would if somebody else catches us doing something that we're not supposed to do. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, like uh, uh, you know, if, there, if, there's, if there's record. Like, we wouldn't do certain things. Like, you wouldn't steal something if you knew that it was going to be recorded on a video camera. You have control over that. I'm not going to do that. Even though you know God would see it, you're more likely to say, okay, well, I, just, I know God will see it. I'll probably get away with it. But if it's on camera, you know, I'm going to. All right, all right. Let's say here's something everybody can relate to. You're more likely to do the speed limit when you know that there's a police officer that's, that's, that's putting in the, the, right? Because you know that you're being recorded. You know that this guy is going to fine you or whatever. But if he's not there, you're like, I know God sees. God's okay with the speeding, I'm pretty sure. But <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, you know, God sees, but he's not going to do anything to me. But that officer right there, I better slow down my, my speed. That's just, that's just how we are. It's human nature because we live in this flesh. Okay? And it's not that we don't believe that God sees or that he can punish us or whatever. It's just like we don't, we don't think about the reality of it until there's repercussions. So what God will allow to happen a lot of times is he'll allow your sin to be found out. And somebody will confront you with that, and something will happen, and then you'll pay for it. You'll pay for it. And even though you're paying for it by the consequences on this earth, the physical consequences, know this, that that's part of God judging you and, and chastening you, okay? And we feel it from the physical uh, of the here and now. And so a lot of times in life, people act as though, you know, God doesn't know we're living in sin, and, uh, and we'll continue doing things and getting away with it or whatever. And then here's what happens. Because, uh, you know, everybody like go through, goes through times in their life where they're, where they're like this. They're living in some kind of a sin, thinking that they're getting away with it, and feeling like, you know, uh, for some reason. Okay, here, here's what happens. Now you're trying to, like, come to God with a problem and you're trying to pray to him. Or now you're sitting down and you're trying to figure out why God's not blessing in this area or that area of your life. And it's like in your mind, it's like you've been living in this sin, and all of a sudden, like you're trying to get something from God, and you're like, I don't understand, God. I thought we were on good terms. Like, I know I've been living in sin, but you never punished me for it. Now, how come you're not blessing me right now? How come you're not answering my prayers right now? And do you know, like, that's part of him showing you that, hey, I know what you're doing. I see it. You can't hide from me. Your sin's going to find you out. Like we, you know, we, many of them in here are familiar with the situation that we had. I'm not going to give any details or talk about it because I don't want to keep, don't want to keep bringing it up, but a situation that we had in Kansas City that was like, how did you not know your sin would find you out? How did you think that I keep living in sin and God's going to bless me? My prayers are going to be answered. I'm going to be productive for the Lord. You, you should know better as a Christian than to think that that's going, going to happen. A lot of times young Christians might feel that way. And we can kind of give some uh, leeway to Moses maybe for this reason. Maybe in Egypt, you know, maybe they weren't raised with, to know about the consequences of sin or something. Uh, maybe we could say, yeah, he was new. You know, he had just decided to walk in, among God's people or whatever. And so he committed this grave sin. But look, he paid for it. And we can expect... You know, the longer we grow as Christians, the longer we've been around, the more we've experienced, it's not like that's going to go away. I mean, we, we know the consequences of our action. We know that our sins will find us out. We know that we're going to pay for it, okay? And so uh, look at Psalm 66, if you would. Psalm 66. In verse 13, this is David. Now, we know David messed up a lot of times. He, fall, he fell into a lot of sins and sometimes, again, acted as though his sin was covered and nobody knew. And then all of a sudden, 
God would allow somebody, a prophet, or somebody point out point out his fault, or or some major punishment among the his people, or whatever, and then he would know I've got to get this situation fixed and uh, and seek forgiveness from the Lord. But here's what he says in verse uh, 13. So Psalm 66, verse 13. I will go into thy house with burnt offerings. I will pay thee my vows, which my lips have uttered and my mouth have spoken when I was in trouble. I will offer unto thee burnt sacrifices of fatlings with the incense of rams. I will offer bullocks and goats, Selah. Come and hear all ye that fear God, and I will declare what he has done for my soul. I cried unto him with my mouth, and he, and he was extolled with my tongue. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. But verily, God hath heard me. He hath attended to, my voice, to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, which hath not turned away my prayer, nor his mercy from me. A lot of people could look at the life of David you know, sometimes as Christians, like we'll preach what people say is an easy believism type gospel, right? Because we're not saying that you have to, re you know, repent and turn from all your sins in order to be saved. And so we'll preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and, hey, we're all sinners and, 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 and he paid that price. And so he offers the gift of salvation. People say, well, you're just giving people a license to sin. Well, the story of David, if anybody was going to give a license to sin, you would think like David... <laughs> The story of David in the Bible gives people a license to sin, right? But the thing is, no, nobody wants to suffer the way that David suffered for the sins that he committed. And you don't know how you're going to suffer for the sins you commit. So nobody's saying, oh, just go ahead and sin. God will forgive you. All we're saying is that Jesus paid the price for your eternal salvation on the cross. And there's nothing you can do, no sins that you can turn from, no works that you can do that's going to earn that or make you worthy of that. You're not worthy of it. However, now that you're a Christian, now that you receive that gift, now we need, to, we need to walk as though we're Christians. And we need to work, you know, walk with the Lord and be right with Him. And so David, was, he, he, was, he was definitely one of God's people. He was definitely saved. But he would mess up. He would reap the consequences. And then he would come to the Lord and say, oh, I'm sorry, search me, you know, clean me from this iniquity and, and, I, and I put this away from me and all this. And then he would come to God with clean hands and be like, hey, search me, God, I'm, I'm look at my heart, like I'm clean, I, I, you know, why aren't you answering me? But he knows if I regard iniquity in my heart, if I know that I'm living in sin and I don't repent of that, get that right of God, from God, then he's not going to listen to me. I'm, I'm talking about Christian, I'm not talking about, you know, I'm not going to be saved then. I'm saying, no, if you're a believer... He's going to kind of cut off that communication with you. If you decide to live in sin and act like it's not going to affect you, you're not going to be able to come to God with your requests and expect Him to hear you. You're not going to feel the blessings in this life. And by blessings, I'm not talking about God's going to make you a millionaire or give you a fancy house or a fancy car. I'm talking about blessings of peace and joy and love and the spiritual gifts that God gives you. You're not going to experience that if you're regarding iniquity in your heart and you're going on as if nothing's going to happen. And it's like mocking God, saying, what are you going to do about it, God? So he is watching. He will make sure that your sin finds you out. Okay, number two. Not only is God watching, the people that you are ministering to are watching, okay, or that you should be ministering to. In this case, look at verse 13. Back to Exodus 2. Exodus 2, verse 13 says, And when he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews. Now, isn't he supposed to be going to the Hebrews? You know, he's like this deliverer, and he's eventually going to, like, bring them out of bondage and, like, and turn them back to God and, and all this stuff. And he says, uh, and he, when he, when he uh, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together, and he said to him that did wrong, Wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? He's trying, hey, my brothers, like, what are you doing? Your brothers, like you're, you're, you're in bondage together. We need each other, right? It's kind of like what he's saying. I feel like that when I see Christians fighting together, I'm like, dude, we got a work to do. We got people to reach. We got, you know, we got a God to serve. And these two churches just bickering at each other, or people inside the church bickering at each other. And praise the Lord, I don't see that in, in, in this church. Uh, but it goes on. 
you know, among churches and in churches all the time. And, uh, and it's like, come on, why are you doing that? So in this case, that natural desire that, that Moses has for his brothers and sisters to get along, and he's like, why are you striving? Why did you smite him? And how does, he, how, how does this guy respond? He says, Who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killest the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. <laughs> He's like, Whoa, I didn't think anybody saw that. Okay? There's a lot of things in life that you don't think anybody sees. But you know what? Who's going to see it? Probably that person that one day you're going to be trying to minister to, and they're going to be like, Psh, Well, you're a hypocrite. That's what they're going to say. Like, you think that I'm going to trust what you have to say? I've been watching you. You know, I've been watching your life. I know that you do this and you do that. And I know that you, you know, and, and, and so what a, a bad mark on the name of the Lord that you, in the name of Christ, would try to reach out and help somebody. And they're like, I've seen the sin in your life. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to go down that route. And so, like, I'm not going to listen to you. And that's kind of what happens. And when I read this story, I get mad at the guy that said, you know, who made thou a judge over us? I mean, because isn't that the worldly, like you try to preach the gospel and they're like, don't judge me, right? And so I get mad about that. I'm like, no, it's right to judge you. You shouldn't be smiting each other. You shouldn't. But in a, in a manner of speaking, they're right to say, what, you just killed a man, and hit him in the sand, and you're going to get on me for smiting? I mean, I mean he, you know, this verse wasn't around yet. Jesus hadn't come to earth yet, but Jesus said, uh, in Matthew uh, 7, you know, why beholdest thou the, the moat in thy brother's eye when there's a beam in your own eye? <laughs> First cast out the beam from your eye, then you can see clearly to get the moat out of your brother's eye. Look, it would be ridiculous to go around with this big old thing in your eye and telling other people how to, you know, <clears throat> I like running and exercising, but I'm always like hesitant to give people advice because like who wants to listen to a fat guy give advice about how to exercise and lose weight? <laughs> You know what I mean? But that's the reality of it. Like, you know, we, you, 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 you if you're going to, you got to practice what you preach, right? That's, that's the idea. Okay, and so here is, here is Moses stepping out as a believer and trying to solve something. And they're like, look at your life. We saw, we saw. And, and we got to remember that when we do things uh, that people are watching us that we're ministering to. I brought this up in, uh, I say I don't want to keep dwelling on it and it just comes up, but I brought this up in Sunday school. Uh, of course, it wasn't on live stream, but, uh, but yesterday, again, I got to witness uh, Brother Justin soul winning with Brother Dean. And Brother Justin had won Brother Dean to the Lord. And many of you all know that there was a time where Brother Justin had fallen into sin and had to be disciplined and all that stuff. And how hard that was on Brother Dean, who... He had led to the Lord. And now it's just like, oh, man. And I remember really worried about that and trying to approach him and, and make sure he was okay and all that stuff because it would be so easy for someone to say, that's the guy that showed me how to be a Christian. He showed me how to get saved. And, and now look what he did. It would be real easy for someone like that to just fall back. You know what I mean? And so when you find out preachers have skeletons in the closet or they run off with the secretary, I could run off with the secretary or the piano player and... <laughs> And uh, I'm all right, because that's my wife. <laughs> but in some churches, that happens, and it's just like, oh, what a mark on that, on that, on the name of the Lord, really, because they, they, you know, everything, it's like almost everything, it's like everything that they preached is now like void, because you're just like, why should I listen to you? You know, look at your life. And so, we've got to remember, people that we're ministering to, or that we should be ministering to, are watching us. Look at Genesis 19. There's this little, just subtle part of the story of Lot that just stands out to me. And I always think about that when, I, when I'm talking about this subject. Matthew 19, 14. So if you're familiar with the story, God's going to wipe out Sodom and Gomorrah with fire and brimstone. But he sends these angels, and primarily this, I think, because Abraham is praying and, uh, and interceding for Lot. And so God sends angels to go take Lot and his family out of Sodom and Gomorrah before he rains fire and brimstone on them. And it says in verse 14, And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, 
which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mock, mocked unto his sons-in-law. And so can you imagine like trying to tell, Hey, God said he's going to destroy this city for their wickedness. Let's go. And they're just laughing. Good one. <laughs> you know, good one. Like you were out just partying yesterday with us, you know, and all, you know, he's, why doesn't he destroy you? I mean, who knows what they were thinking? I'm reading into that. I'm, I'm pulling a Hollywood on you. <laughs> I'm reading into that a little bit. But the idea is that they didn't believe Lot. Like he didn't have a testimony that made them say, but we better listen to him. He seemed as one that mocked it. That's the way I read that uh, passage of Scripture. Okay, so here Moses has an opportunity to help his people, and they won't even receive him. And he ends up 40 years in the backside of the desert. And we'll see that when we get to chapter 3. Okay, but the final point is this. So God's watching us. The people that we're supposed to be ministering to are watching us. But number three, our enemies are watching us. Our enemies are watching us. Look at Revelation chapter 12, and I'll be reading that here in a minute. We know, 1 Peter says that, the, that Satan walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, right? So we know that Satan is our enemy, and he's trying to devour us. He's trying to find a reason to destroy us. Revelation chapter 12 <coughs> excuse me, says that he is an accuser of the brethren. Revelation 12. This is an interesting story. It's kind of, it is prophetic. Um, there are different interpretations of it. Some people, you know, disagree about the interpretation. But uh, I believe, I believe it's somewhat prophetic, but I believe it's really talking about something that's, that's going to happen to Satan in the, in the last time, like, like right around the, uh, right before the rapture, actually. And uh, it says, and there appeared another wonder. This is uh, Revelation 12, verse 3. There appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his head, and his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her children, I mean her child, as soon as it was born. And the child here uh, is probably talking about Jesus. This is probably like summarizing basically all Bible history up until this point, like in just these few verses. Okay, And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all the nations with the rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. I believe it's talking about Jesus. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God that they should feed her there. A thousand two hundred and three score days. That's three and a half years. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought uh, and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. In case you don't know who we're talking about, I love how he gives a description here. That old serpent, right? Go back to Genesis and you'll see. Called the devil. And Satan, right? I mean, the, all of his names, like you're, you know who we're talking about. Which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now you say, well, I thought he was already cast out. You know, he's him and his fallen angels, and, and now he roams about on the earth. Yes, he roams about on the earth, but somehow, and I don't completely understand this, but the way I, I read this and I understand it, is that he has access to God. He has a way, he can still go, and it's kind of like if you go back to the book of Job, okay? And he comes and he, the, their sons of God are presenting themselves before the Lord, and Satan's there. And Satan's like, hey, have you considered Job? And he's, what is he doing? He's accusing Job. He's like, you know, hey, well, you're, you know, the only reason he's worshiping you is because you haven't allowed harm to come his way. But if, if I go, like, mess him up a little bit and put some harm, and, and God allows it. You know, for whatever, however that plays out, it seems it's kind of like a weird story to us. But however that plays out, Satan's got a job on this earth until the Lord comes and, 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 and locks him up, right? He's got a job to do on this earth. And part of that job right now is, is he's constantly getting permission from God. And then he comes down, seeks who he may devour. And it's kind of like his job, his job from the very beginning, like in the garden, has always been trying to provide, you know, cause people to sin, 
and then be like, oh, God, did you see that sin right there? You know, <laughs> he's just trying to mess things up. And this is how Satan works. And so it says that he was cast out into the earth. I don't believe, you know, yes, he's, he is fallen. We read about that. He was a cherub that fell. Uh, and Ezekiel talks about that. And Isaiah talks about that. So he is fallen. But he still has access to heaven. But one day that access is going to be cut off. And he's going to go and, and the, take the fallen angels with him. And it says, he was cast onto the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Verse 10, and I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Now, I believe what's going on is that at that time, Satan is going to just bring his fury upon the earth. Okay, and this is right before the Lord comes. And time's going to get real rough for believers, and then, and then we're going to go to be with the Lord while he pours out his final wrath on, on the earth. Okay, but there's rejoicing in heaven because they're like, this is it. You know, this is it. He's finally, like, going to get that last little bit out of the way, and then God's going to come, and, and uh, uh, the Lord's going to come and take, take care of him. But I said all that <laughs> just because I wanted you to explain how, well, what I see in that text. But I said all that because here we see that Satan is, throughout all history of the earth, has been an accuser of the brethren. We saw it played out in Job. We saw it played out in the garden. I mean, just constantly. He's, he's just trying to turn people over. He, 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 he was part of Judas, right? Turning uh, the, Lord, uh, the Lord over to the authorities. And, and uh, he's, he's part of all that goes on. He's going to be part of the, the Antichrist and the beast. You know, he's going to give power unto the beast. And, uh, and so Satan is this accuser of the brethren. Now, what I'm getting at is that when we sin, when we decide to, to sin, now, look, there's always going to be scoffers. There's always going to be people who, you know, we're not ministering to. We don't, they don't really care about us. They just want to see us fall. And there's not, not a whole lot that we can do about that. Okay? But those who, who are, like, just right there, they're very involved in our ministry, you know, and they're... Uh, and, and they're waiting to watch us fall. They're waiting to watch us messed up, mess up. And it's like, it's like Satan himself is just like you know, is hovering over and just wanting to see, you know, he's going to gain this great victory for watching people just fall into sin and then just not deal with that sin and then watch all these things fall apart and all that kind of stuff. And so go back to Exodus chapter 2. Moses had a great opportunity, although he might not have completely knew it or understood it, and it's going to be 40 years before he gets a clear instruction from the Lord, but he had an opportunity to set his people free, right? And he could have possibly worked, started working out the negotiations with the king and, you know, you know appealed to his mother. You know, she's got some, uh, some authority there and, and uh, some clout. And he could have began that work, that process. But what happened? He entered into the sin, which now has, you know, has been watched by those enemies, which, which now he's got to be on the run from them. You know? And so he's, he's been seen by his enemy there. Look at verse uh, uh, 14. And Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. And the last verse we read, Now when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses, but Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian and sat down by a well. Now, God deals with Moses for 40 years, and he, you know, he gives him a wife. He gives him a good father-in-law. He, he allows him to learn all, this thing, uh, all these things by dealing with sheep, and, and praise the Lord for that. But the fact of the matter is his enemies got the better hand. You know what I mean? Of the situation and ran him off. He had to be run off and like hindered from doing what he should have been doing. And, and as a result, for another 40 years, the people are still there in Egypt in bondage being, being slaves and going under this uh, uh, extreme slavery. So Moses 
you know, gave, if you will, he kind of gave uh, upper hand to the devil. And he gave upper hand to his enemies who were waiting to, uh, uh, to see, the, you know, Satan's, uh, Satan's work prevail and the Lord's work fail. <clears throat> so, again, obviously there are also scoffers who are, are watching and waiting you to fail. People that don't even believe in the Lord and they're, and they're just waiting for Christians to mess up. I mean, they're waiting for some juicy, you know, information to hit the tabloids about some preacher that messed up or some, or, or somebody, you know, that, that was, uh, had a huge internet presence or something like that. And he's preaching and he's, he's saying that this sin's wrong and that sin's wrong. And everybody's just waiting for him to mess up so that they can expose this great sin that this person did. Well, here's the thing. Don't give them that satisfaction. <laughs> okay. Obviously just don't sin because God's watching. And don't sin because people are watching that you're supposed to be ministering to. You don't want to be a hypocrite and where they don't listen to you, whatever. But look, if that's not enough to convince you, don't give your enemies the satisfaction of watching you fall into sin. And keep these things before your mind and they'll help us because somebody is always watching. Moses started his Christian life out learning this lesson. And many new believers, unfortunately, will likewise mess up and then they'll find out this lesson the hard way. Like they fall into some kind of sin and they, hey, they gave Satan the victory and, and all these things, okay? But the concept is very simple. Keep in mind that God's watching. People you're ministering are, to, are watching. Uh, people that you're ministering to are watching. And your enemies are watching. Hopefully that will keep us from falling into sin. Father, we thank you for your word. And I do uh, pray that you'll help us to have uh, power over Satan. But we can only do that through walking in the Spirit and... Uh, denying the flesh. And so I pray that you'll help give us the strength to do that and the ability to do that. I pray you get the glory for uh, any fruit that we have as Christians, uh, Lord. And I just pray that you'll give us the spiritual gifts and, and uh, give us the fruit of the Spirit, and love, joy, and peace, and, uh, and help us to live the victorious Christian life as we seek to uh, deny ourselves of the uh, worldly pleasures as Moses uh, decided to do, but help us not to fall and to give way to, um, to the devil. I uh, pray that you be glorified in the rest of the services today. Give us safety as we travel back and forth and bless those who came out today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.